Hello, in this segment I want to back up and ask the question why should we study the attributes of God? And I want to begin by reading from the book of Isaiah chapter 42 and starting in verse 1. And while we're doing that, remember our first segment in which we talked about that the Lordship attributes included his power, his authority, and his presence. Um, look for those as we read these and just notice all the different attributes of God. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations he will not cry out, or lift up his voice, or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged, till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to give or to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to, to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare, before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing to the Lord a new song, is praise from the end of the earth. Now, I wanted to begin um, after reading that. Um, you could tell that there's multiple attributes of God that are mentioned in there. I won't take the time to um, enumerate all of them, but we can see God's tenderness, uh, his righteousness, his Trinitarian nature, um, his covenantal um, way of interacting with people, and um, his uh, omnipotent power as creator. But I wanted to read this quote from A.W. Tozer. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Let me say that again. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Do you believe that? I do. I, I really do. What comes into your mind when you think about God? What is, what is He like? What's your mental conception of who God is? See, that's the whole purpose of this series on systematic theology in general, but now in particular on the doctrine of God, is that Tozer is absolutely right. What we think about God is the rudder that guides us, consciously or unconsciously. And there are so many bad and or mistaken ideas about God, both in and outside of the church. If we have lofty views of God, high and holy, lofty views of God, then we'll have high, 
holy, lofty worship. We'll have holy lives. It will affect how we evangelize. It'll affect everything about our lives. How we view God. If we have low, unlofty views of God, then we'll have man-centered worship and unholy lives. And there's many Christians, professing Christians, whose faith makes very little to no difference in their lives. And I'm convinced that it comes back primarily to a um, pervasive, low view of God in our culture and at the greatest need of the church today is to recapture the incomparable greatness of God. Because, in fact, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It will it's, it's what guides us in every area of our life. And it's the most important thing about us in so many different ways. It certainly determines, obviously, how we view God and how we relate to Him. But if you tell me what your view of God is, then... I can tell you a lot of the rest of the story. I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but it affects every area of life. Um, it affects our understanding of ourselves. That is, our understanding of who God is will affect our understanding of ourselves, our understanding of sin, and consequently our understanding of salvation and how that's done. Uh, our understanding of what God is like will affect our worldview because um, it the the first aspect or the cornerstone of anyone's worldview is their um, idea of what is ultimate reality, God, and everything else that flows from a worldview. Uh, that cornerstone, their understanding of God, particularly how transcendence and eminence play off against each other, is going to affect how they view man, uh, the nature of reality, the flow of history, our purpose in life, the basis for ethics, and what happens in the afterlife. So, in our worldview, in general, in our view of God, is like spectacles. I, I don't wear glasses other than to read. It seems like on my 40th birthday, I, I started having trouble reading fine print. Seriously, it was like to the day. It was weird. But, when we think of God, it affects how... How, how we think, how we feel, and how we act. And a definite, um, let's talk about, since we're doing a, an in-depth series on the attributes of God, I think it would be appropriate to define what an attribute is. And according to one definition, an attribute is a quality or feature regarded as a characteristic or an inherent trait of someone or something. Okay? And some synonyms for attribute is quality, characteristic, trait, feature, element, aspect, um, distinction, uh, hallmark, or mark, or property. And so when we're talking about getting to know another person, as we mentioned before, that's not something that's done overnight. 
the more we know about a person, the more we're able to get to know them. You know, the more we know about the person's family, their history, their likes, their dislikes, their fears, their dreams, and just that whole gamut of knowledge about a person enables us to grow in our knowledge of them. And um, since our knowledge of God is supremely personal, it's the most personal of relationships, the same uh, principle applies that the more we know about God, his attributes, then that should elicit in us a greater love for him and knowledge, personal knowledge of him. Um, attributes, we don't want this just to be an abstract study about God that doesn't lead to a deeper, passionate worship of God. The reason I read that text from Isaiah is it's a classic expression of a man who was, Isaiah, was outlining many different attributes of God in that text. But you may have noticed the very last thing that he says um, let us sing a new song. That is, his theology led to doxology or worship. And as we've met, as we've mentioned before, that all good theology leads to doxology. Um, but as we uh, have, we have to realize that we can't love in our heart what we don't know in our heads first. That's the way God has made us. Um, and that's why I'm taking this approach, is that, um, sure, people take the knowledge that I'm giving them in this series and it not impact their lives. And it takes the uh, illumination of the Holy Spirit in order to um, make that impact. But it has to start in the head because the heart cannot embrace something that the mind has not first received. Okay, God doesn't give immediate knowledge to us. He um, gives knowledge to our via, you know, our reason or rationality, and then the Holy Spirit uses that to um, help us to grow in our understanding of God's greatness. So as we talk about these various aspects or attributes of God, such as his incomprehensibility, his omnipotence, and next time I think his omnipresence, um, and you know the list is going on, probably be about 10 that um, aspects or attributes of God that we're going to look at. It was um, probably more than anyone else outside of Scripture. It was Jonathan Edwards who um, pressed home to me uh, the idea that true spirituality manifested itself in a deep delight in uh, a relishing of the attributes of God, and you know he was very, he was a very astute you know he he was used by God to to be part of the great what great awakening, and um, but he, he was very aware of true and false conversions. And um, one of the things that he stated at the outset was that one of the main characteristics of a true conversion was that the attributes that we're talking about aren't just notions that 
jumble around and jangle, jangle around in a person's head that a person might find intellectually stimulating, but rather um, for a person who is really converted, those are ideas that should bring, they should be seen as like moral excellence. Um, there is, it's like spiritual honey to the soul. Uh, there is a sweetness to studying God's attributes um, that is kind of hard to express in words, but there is just, again, that um, beauty of, um, of, like I said, of contemplating God's moral excellence and relishing in that. And so I just would ask you, when you think of God's character and his attributes, how do you feel about God? Um, do you relish in the moral excellencies of God? Um, you take supreme delight in in him you know again it's one thing to read about the taste of honey but it's another thing to actually taste honey and as the psalmist says taste and see that the Lord is good and all these attributes that were talked about are meant to be tasted in our personal experience, experiencing these attributes. And so I would ask you again what, what um, A.W. Tozer said, what, or state, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. My passion in going through this series is that by the end of it we all might be able to have a greater grasp that when we think about God that our conception of him will be significantly and substantially changed for the good that is, it will be uh, deepened, sweetened, and, you know, it will be uh, in its lofty position to where it is supposed to be. And again, I believe that's the greatest need of our generation, is a recapturing of God's holiness um, and just his moral excellence and his incomparable greatness so i um, i offer this really as a um, introduction to our series on the attributes of god so that we might get oriented on where this should take us okay all right let's pray father son and holy spirit you are worthy of all worship, praise, and honor. And I pray that what we think of you and how we think of you might be stretched and that we might have a, a deeper and fuller understanding of your incomparable greatness for your glory. And in Jesus' name, amen.